Our Prophet said hadith is in Muslim Imam Ahmad that most of his followers will be from the Yahud. Now, this leads us to a very interesting issue and uh, tangent. We had mentioned last class, last week, that the Christian belief is very similar to our belief, especially the evangelicals, that Jesus is the Messiah and he shall come back towards the end of times, that there shall be a false Messiah, the Antichrist, and that Christ and Antichrist will fight it out, and that Christ will win over the Antichrist in the great Armageddon. In this rough skeleton, we are the same. No issues. Now, with the devil's in the detail, and they have a lot of other ikhtilafat, but in this skeleton, evangelicals, Baptists, Muslims, we all believe the same thing. Of course, there are many uh, differences uh, of them. We do not have this as an explicit mention, but they do. And that is that this will only happen when the Bani Israel are gathered in the Holy Land. Okay, this is the belief of evangelicals. That Jesus will only come back when all of the Bani Israel are gathered in the Holy Land. And therefore, because they want to see their Lord and Savior, they are eager to bring the Bani Israel to the Holy Land. Are you guys following? I'm being... I'm being so they want the people of that faith tradition to go to that land. And it is because of this that some of the most hardcore Zionists are not people of the Jewish faith. They are evangelicals. Because it is their aqidah, it is their aqidah that with the return of the promised people to the promised land, their savior will come back. So they want to expedite that. Now, ironically, they believe when the savior comes, the one of the first things he's going to do is to get rid of those who didn't believe in him. And primarily, according to their aqidah, the people who tried to kill him or actually succeeded in killing because they believe they succeeded. Now, this is the irony of ironies. Think about it. I need you to understand my point here. This group wants to expedite and support the Bani Israel to go to this land with the aqidah that they will all be destroyed in that land. You understand this? They are ardent Zionists and they have no love for the people whom they are helping. On the contrary, their aqidah is that the very people they're helping you understand this point, right? Wallahi, ajab al ujab, ajib. How can the other group accept their aid knowing that this group wants us dead? And you know, my mind was perplexed, and I actually, you know, I am an interfaith person, I'm involved in whatnot. I had a friendship with one of the rabbis of, of uh, Memphis, and we would go out to lunch every you know, few weeks and whatnot. It's good to have interfaith and friendship, and we got to a very frank point. So I actually asked him, I said, aren't you embarrassed to accept help from people who think that helping you will eventually cause you to be killed? Yani, isn't there some haya sharam, some dignity, some izzah? Like the very people who want to get rid of you, they're helping you in the aqidah that you will be gotten rid of. And he just smirked, he goes, well, that's their belief. If they want to throw money and power at us, then... You know, we don't believe it's going to happen. It's their, basically, he said in a nutshell, if they're foolish enough to believe it, that's their business. I'm, we're going to still accept their power and help. So we have to understand this point, O oh Muslims. The people who are supporting this guy in the White House, right? This whole move to Jerusalem, the capital, whatnot. This is all a tactical decision. He might be a blabbering idiot, but he is a tactical blabbering idiot. He knows what he's doing. He is feeding his base. Another tangent here, subhanAllah. 
He is feeding his base. He's giving them the scraps from the table. Why is he doing this? He knows his base is evangelical. He knows this people, they want him. And so they feed him this stuff for do, to do what? Because they want this land to be the promised land for the promised people so that the Messiah comes and gets rid of these very people to establish heaven on earth and whatnot and the final judgment day. All of this is going to happen. So this is the aqidah of the evangelicals. By the way, Catholics are different. Please, Muslims, educate yourselves. Don't be yani, kindergarten level in your education and just extrapolate. Every Christian group is different. Every firqa is different. Learn your firaq if you want to get involved in this issue. Otherwise, do not speak. Speak with knowledge or remain silent. Various groups have different aqidahs. The Mormons are different. They have their own beliefs. The Seventh-day Adventists are totally different in this regard. And of course, the evangelicals, which is of course the default in the state, the Baptists and whatnot, these are the ones that we're talking about. No, and their aqidah is in some ways very similar to ours, in some ways it's different. So that's the Yehud. Uh, sorry, that's the, uh, the Christians. How about the Yehud? How about the Yehud? What is their belief in the Messiah? And why is our Prophet ﷺ saying that the majority of, of, of the followers of, of uh, the Jal will be from that group? Well, in Jewish eschatology, the term uh, Mashiach, uh, Messiah, it refers specifically, they do have this aqidah, and it refers to a future king, king from the line of David. Okay? So, mainstream Jewish belief is that there will be a person from the line of David, from the descendants of Dawood, who will be a king, and he will be anointed, Masih, he will be anointed with holy oil, and he will bring in the Messianic age, he will bring in the end of times. So, the Masih in their aqidah is called the King Masih, Malach Mashiach, Malak, Malach Mashiach, the King Messiah, because for them, the Messiah is a political figure, not a religious reformer. Okay? For them, it was the Messiah is a one of power and politics, and not somebody who comes to Zkiyatun Nafs and, you know, Isa is coming and telling them, you know, Ubashirukum and giving you glad tidings. The, you know, the Bushra is the Evangelion or the Evangelical, uh, the, the Injil. Injil, evangelical, by the way, evangelical and Injil, the same term. Injil is Injil, the good tidings, the evangelical, that's where it comes from. So the Messiah in, in, uh, in Jewish folklore is a king from the line of Dawood who will bring about the restoration of the status of the Israelites and reconstruct the temple of Israel. Okay? So they do believe in the Messiah as a political figure and who will bring back the kingdom of who? Of Dawood. And this has been a mainstream of ancient, medieval, and even some modern Jewish movements as we're going to come to right now. And that is why, dear Muslims, when the Messiah Isa came and he began preaching to the Bani Israel and he claimed he was the Messiah, the Yehud did not care about a Messiah that's a spiritual reformer. They wanted a Messiah who is what? Who is a king. And so when they found out that this person is not a king, they went and complained to the king to the Roman Emperor and they said we have a man who is claiming to be the king of the Israelites did Isa claim to be king hello did Isa claim to be king why did the Yehud say he's claiming to be king are you guys following this because he claimed to be the Messiah and in the eyes of the Yehud the Messiah is who the king and so what happened with Pontius Pilate, what happened with them happened, and they said, oh, this is a political agitator. They would not have cared if, they, if Jesus said he's a religious reformer. They didn't care. What is there to do with a religious reformer? But they did worry that he's claiming to be a king. They don't want any political trouble. And that's why what happened happened. And so they then went to arrest him. And then what happened, we will talk maybe in a, another lecture. What do we Muslims believe and what are the various theories out there? But anyway, now you understand that issue. Now, the issue we need to come back to is that belief in the advent of the Messiah 
was a mainstream of Jewish uh, theology. And for them, the Messiah will bring back the power and the Izzah of the kingdom of David that used to be. And therefore, when the single greatest theologian of Jewish uh, uh, law and Jewish theology, there is only one that is Shaykh al-Islam amongst them. There is one amongst them in all of their history that they consider to be the greatest Jewish mind. And that is the Jewish theologian, the most famous in the history of Judaism. Hmm? Anybody? Hmm? Yes, very good. But who? Oh, Muslims, you should know this name because he was an Arab, meaning... He spoke Arabic, that's what I mean. He lived in the lands of Muslims. He spoke Arabic more fluently than any language. He wrote in Arabic, Arabi. And, totally different tangent. Why am I going to these tangents? There is a theory that for a period of his life, he was a Muslim. Because he studied in a madrasa. He memorized portions of the Quran. He studied fiqh and aqidah in the Islamic tradition because back in those days, all universities were run by Muslims. Back in those days, you know, if you go to university here, right, you go to UTD or SMU or something, they, they tell you, you must take, you must take American history, you must take political science, you must, these are the required courses, right? You cannot graduate in this country without taking these courses, right? Well, once upon a time, if you wanted to go to any university and study engineering or medicine or optics, you would have to study Fiqh 101, basics of Sharia. Okay, you have to study Tafsir of the Quran. I'm not joking. This is exactly what needed to be done. Okay, that was the, that. so Musa ibn Maymun, Maimonides, you should know the name. Maimonides, memorize this name. This is the single greatest intellectual of Jewish history completely. They call him the chief rabbi, Rambam. Rambam, the chief rabbi. He was the greatest rabbi in the history of Judaism. He codified Jewish law. He and the, Jew, the Jewish law that he codified is basically after he studied Islamic Sharia. Ah, now he's writing a book of fiqh. Okay, and he is the first and most important Jewish figure to write a book of aqidah. The book of theology. He wrote a book of theology and he summarized it in 13 points. And he called it the 13 principles of Iman. 13 principles of Iman. Why did he summarize Aqidah? Because he studied Aqidah from the Muslims and now he wants to do the same for the Jewish faith. And so Jewish Aqidah, when it comes to many things, is actually coming from the philosophy of uh, the philosophy of uh, Ibn Rushd, Averroes, and others, because Musa ibn Maymun, Maimonides, and Averroes were basically coming from the same philosophical strand. Anyway, back to our topic. So, Musa ibn Maymun, Maimonides, wrote a book called The Thirteen Principles of Faith. By the way, you can look it up, it's translated into English. And each principle begins with the phrase, Ani ma'min, ana mu'min, ana mu'min, ana mu'min, ani ma'min in Hebrew. Ana mu'min, this, I believe in this, I believe in this, I believe in this. The twelfth principle of these thirteen, the twelfth principle of these thirteen, and I quote from the translation, my Hebrew is too weak to actually read it to you, I'm not going to embarrass you with that, but I quote from the translation, I believe with full faith, ani ma'min, ana mu'min, in the coming of the Messiah. This is in the Aqidah of Maimonides, which is the standard Aqidah of the Jewish peoples up until our times. He is the only one who has codified to that level, Aqidah and Fiqh. I believe with full faith, Yaqeen, certainty in the coming of the Messiah. And even though he delays, with all that delay, I eagerly await his arrival, every day anticipating his arrival. This is the Aqidah of Maimonides that the Yehud would memorize, that they still believe to this day. And as I have mentioned to you earlier, when you have a religion whose values become so watered down that they don't stand for anything, the very people say, what is this? It's not a religion anymore. And they will go back to an actual religion. And this is a big warning to those amongst the Muslim community who are flirting with progressive Islam. When Islam becomes the flavor of the month, then you have no Islam left. Then what is the purpose of being a Muslim? 
when the halal becomes what is politically correct and the haram becomes what is politically incorrect and you have no backbone to stand on and you think you are preserving your faith in reality you are losing it your children will not have any faith what do you have left anymore our faith is not based upon the whims of society around us we have the quran we have our sharia we have the wahi from allah now i'm not saying we have to be intransigent no our ulama especially our forward thinking ulama have to navigate the flow where there's allowance we will take it but where there is none we will not take it where there's a red line we do not go that area so that's a point we learn in the 1960s 70s there was a massive as i said almost everybody is going reform their own children began rejecting it and they said what is this there's nothing there there is no to be reformed you can be atheist you can deny god there's no sharia you can eat pork and whatnot. And there's like, what, what, what is left of my Jewishness? And they will say, what is left if there's nothing? So there's going back to the asal. And the asal is orthodox. That is the hardcore, literalism. Now, within orthodox, there are many, many uh, strands. And of course, you have the Hasidic Orthodox. You are all familiar with the Hasidic, H-A-S-I-D-A, the Hasidic. And the Hasidic in particular is a strand of Orthodox. They have a very strong and passionate belief about the coming of the Messiah that is very imminent, just about to appear. And they believe, and this is important again, that the more pious they are, the more quickly the Messiah will come. And that explains their fervousness that explains their ultra yani, literalism right they want to be the more pious they are so the more faithful they are the faster will come the the messiah right and so they are very very hardcore about this and within Hasidism, so this is, I'm teaching you the firaq within Orthodox Judaism, okay? Uh, by the way, Reform does not believe in the Messiah. It's com um, completely, obviously, right? Reform doesn't believe. Conservatives, mushkila with them is they don't really have la ilaha ula wa la ilaha ula mudabdabin. They don't have, yani, the conservatives, they don't really have a platform per se because at least with the, uh, at least with the Orthodox, they're hardcore. Like everything is all the way, right? The Reform, nothing. Throw everything out the window. The conservatives, they don't really have a platform. Some here, some there. How do you decide? Each conservative strand has its own issue. So amongst the conservatives, some of them believe in the Messiah, some of them don't. Amongst the Orthodox, they all believe in the Messiah. Is that clear? Right? That's why they're still Orthodox. They believe in the coming of the Messiah. The Hasidics are of the most Messianic amongst them. And within Hasidism, there is the most prominent stand of Hasidism. It's called the Chabad, C-H-A-B-D, the Chabad movement, the Chabad, the Chabad movement. The Chabad movement in particular is the most messianic, so much so, the greatest, one of the greatest Jewish figures of, of our times, an American uh, born uh, uh, in, in Russia, migrated after Germany coming here. He died in 1994. His name was Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, one of the most famous rabbis um, presidents from what is it uh, uh, I forgot who is it Ford or whatever onwards they would have a regular he was like America's rabbi of the Orthodox community of course he's passed away 1994 his followers began to claim that that person is the Messiah like that's how imminent it is still to this day some of his followers believe that the rabbi did not die that he is still alive in hiding which sounds similar to other groups, which is why similarities are made between that group and this group, but that is again besides this point. So the point being, belief in Messiah is common amongst the Yehud. Therefore, do you think it is surprising when towards the end of time, somebody with power comes and claims to be the Messiah, and he is from that background, is it surprising that lots of people will then accept that claim. It makes sense. You now understand why our Prophet ﷺ said that many of his followers will be of that group. Now, important point. Our Prophet ﷺ did not say many of that group will be his followers. Big difference. It is possible that many of that group, many of the Jews will recognize truth and falsehood. It is possible. But 
from those who choose to follow him, many will be from that background. You understand the difference, right? Large circle, Venn diagram, small circle.